Good morning. Good morning. I got a half Bible. We'll travel. In the first four chapters of the book of uh, Galatians, Paul proved to us that grace is a free gift of God. We, we, we've been looking at the first four chapters of the book, and now we're going to look at uh, chapter 5 today and then chapter 6 next week. And we learned in the first four chapters of the Bible that we can't work for it, we can't buy it, we can't lease it, we can't rent His grace, we can't steal His grace. His grace is a free gift. It's given to all who believe in the Son, Jesus Christ. And we also learned that Paul, as an apostle, was taught personally by Jesus Christ, that the Spirit taught him the gospel, and so he has the power and the authority to preach this part of the gospel, that grace is free. His word is true, his doctrine is true, and his theology is true because he received his education from Christ. Then in chapters 5 and 6, what we'll look at today in chapter 5 is the instructions on how to apply this grace. You might want to turn that down just a little bit. I get a little ring there. Um, how to apply this grace into our lives. How do we use it? The grace is free. It's given to us. Now what do we do with it? And here's what verse 1 says. It says, It was for the freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. The freedom that Christ offers us and the freedom that we have in our minds is quite different. What we think about freedom and the way we think about freedom is the complete opposite of what the freedom that God gives us. We think our freedom means we can do anything we want to do when we want to do it. We're free. We can just do what we want to do and that's what we have is we have freedom. But that kind of freedom is both dangerous and destructive and it can infringe upon not only our freedom but the freedom of other people. For instance, let's say I decided tomorrow that I wanted to drive along the road on the left-hand side of the road. I'm free to do it. I have the freedom to pull my car over on the left-hand side of the road and drive down the road just as fast as I want. Is it dangerous and destructive? Of course it will be. Eventually it would be very dangerous and very destructive. And it could be the same thing to you because I could infringe upon your freedom by running into you. And so that's not the freedom that God wants us to have. Maybe I decide to become a, a, an alcoholic or a, addicted to drugs. I have that freedom. I can do that anytime I want to. But again, it's destructive and damaging to my family and to others. And so that's not what God has in mind when he says, I have set you free. That's not what he's thinking about. So let me give you this morning four examples of what he is talking about so we'll understand what these are. First off, we're free from man's religion. When he says we're free, we're free from the religion of men. We're free to follow one religion, one faith, if you will, and not a religion. Second, we're free from sin and the power of sin. And I'm going to go through each of these individually here this morning, but I think you'll find some eye-opening things about what this freedom affords us. And it's really incredible the amount of freedom that we do have and what he's given us. Third, we're free from the fear and from the fact of death itself. We're free from death and we're free from the fear of death. And fourth, we're free from Satan's grip. So those are the four primary things that he set us free from. When he died on the cross, he set us free from those four things. So let's look at them one at a time here and look and see what they say. Has anyone ever said to you, I don't go to church because I don't like organized religion? Have you heard that? I don't really go to church because I, I really don't like to organize religion. And so I just, you know, I stay home and I watch it on TV and, you know, there's just too many rules and just too many regulations and all of that. And when someone says that to me, I say, perfect, because that's the way I feel too. I feel the exact same way. I don't want to belong to any group that calls itself an organized religious group. I don't like creeds, I don't like customs, I don't like man's rules. I want to come to church and I want to do one thing. I want to get rid of religion and I want to build a relationship. Amen. That's what I'm here. I want to trade religion for a relationship with Jesus Christ and for each and with each of you. When I come in here I want to know you, I want to know who you are, I want to have that relationship and I want that relationship to spill over with the relationship that we all have with Jesus Christ because we're all one member of his body. And that's what we should be here for, not to follow man's rules and creeds. And so we've been set aside uh, from all of that because all religion does is make us feel closer to God, but it doesn't bring him any closer to us. 
we feel really good when we come in and we look and somebody's got a rule that says you can't do this and you can't do that and we can sit here and say well this week I didn't do that and I didn't do this and I really feel close to God well good but he's not really any closer to you it's the relationship that brings him closer that's what Christ did on the cross he bridged that gap between us and the father he's the bridge that we walk over to get to the father and just like he has many sons and daughters, we too are his sons and daughters. We're heirs to his throne and we receive his power from him. So we're not free to do what we want to do when we want to do it. That's not what freedom is. Um, Paul is saying, throw away your ideas of religion. Put them aside, replace them with what I said, replace them with that relationship. Throw all of man's rules and regulations away and worry only about one thing and that's are we following Jesus and building a relationship with him? The second thing that he said that uh, we are set free from was sin and the control of sin and the need to sin. So there's three things. We're free from sin itself. We're free from the control that sin has over us. And we're also free from the need to sin. When Christ Jesus says he's in us, we receive the freedom from him who is in us and we don't longer have to sin any longer we don't have to sin we can actually fight back when we have the when we have the opportunity if you will or the inkling to sin we can defeat the temptations of sin and defeat sin by simply saying no because we have that power and we have the power to say no over and over and over again because we have Christ in us we can say no as many times as it takes for that temptation to go away we're we're sinners by nature Right, and the Bible says we're sinners by nature. As I've said this before, by nature it means I, I breathe by nature and I blink my eyes by nature. I just do it without even thinking. I can do the same thing with sin. Without even thinking, I can sin. It doesn't take much to get me off, off, the, off the path. It doesn't make much to get any of us off the path. But we don't have to step off in it if we don't want to. Because if we do engage in sin, what are we engaging in? Our own free will to sin. We have free will, but he still get, we still have the free will to sin. And so it's up to us. Nobody forces us to sin. Nobody can push us into sinning. Nobody can, can uh, uh, decide that we want to sin. It's a personal thing that we have to personally sin ourselves. It has to come into here or come into here, and then it has to come out of here or out of here, or whatever the actions and words are. We have to personally, by our freedom, choose to sin. We have the power not to if we don't want to. And also it goes much further than that because he also says that we're free from the shame of sin. Does the shame of sin bother you? Does it, does it stay inside you? It does me. I look back on my life and I say, oh man, the stupid things I did and the stupid things I said and, you know, and I shouldn't have done this and I shouldn't have, and wouldn't it have been great if I found Christ at 10? <laughs> that would have, that would have, my teenage years would have been gone. <laughs> We all look back and we all have this, this shame that we feel in sin, but we don't have to feel that anymore. We don't. We are free from it. We're free from the guilt. We're free from the feelings of sin. Uh, we shouldn't spend our lives looking back. We, could li we should literally spend our lives from this point looking forward. The past is the past. We're totally free of sin. Whatever we did in the past need to stay in the past. When Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, our sins died with him. All of our sins died with him. Not only our past sins, but our present sins and our future sins. So they're gone. So if you feel bad about your sins, stop. They're over. They're over with. Isaiah 43, 25 says this. He says, I alone am the one who wipes out your wrongdoings for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. If Christ doesn't remember them, and if God doesn't remember them, why would we? Why would we even care to remember them if he, if he doesn't remember them? God sheds his grace upon us literally and wipes away all of our sins. Wipes away the shame of our sins, wipes away the guilt of our sins, to the fact where he no longer even remembers our sins. And that's huge. And I'll tell you why that's huge, because as Christians, we, we would forgive each other. Let, let's say I sinned against one of you. As a Christian, I would come up to you and I'd say, oh, I'm so sorry I sinned, I made a terrible mistake. Uh, please forgive me. And, and you would forgive me because we're Christian brothers and sisters, but would you forget? Probably not. 
Probably not. And, and there would always be that little something between us, wouldn't there? There would always be that little bit of, eh, I'll just stand back a little bit, I'll stand back a little bit, I'll stand back a little bit more between us. And that's what God doesn't want. He says in there, he says, for my own sake, it says, I will not remember your sins. Because he doesn't want that between us. He doesn't want to stand back from us. He wants to run to us and he wants us to run to him. So not only does he forgive our sins, but he doesn't remember them. And that's huge. That's the freedom that he gave us. I remember this little verse over the years um, that's kind of helped me. It says, it says, if I can't earn it, I can't unearn it. And earn it is grace. If I can't earn it, I can't unearn it. If I can't do anything to receive it, I can't do anything to lose it. And I don't even know if unearn is a word, so don't look it up in the dictionary. <laughs> but I, I always remember that. If I can't earn it, I can't unearn it. And that's always helped me, and I think it might help you too in the future. If you're thinking about something in the past and you're shaking your head and you're going, oh boy, forget it, it's gone, it's gone. The third thing that we've been freed from is the fear of death. And I think that that's amazing. That's, that's huge. Let's talk about that for just a minute and see if we can understand it. What, what a blessing it is uh, that he set us free from the fear of death and from death itself. Death itself we understand. It's the resurrection. We follow him. But we're also free from the fear of death. How many people do you know that have this fear of death to this day. They're probably just not saved. A lot of them aren't saved. But they have this ongoing fear of death. And that's what people had in the Old Testament through the whole way. God looked at that for years and years and years and years and years. And he saw that we were in bondage by this fear of death. And he said it right. We consist of body, soul, and spirit. And our spirits allow us to commune with God. To be with God. To be in his presence. Um, but at one time, we were in his presence. Our purity and our innocence allowed us to be in the presence of God. Remember Adam and Eve in the garden? They were in God's presence, not because necessarily they had the spirit, but also because they were pure and innocent. But when they sinned, they lost their purity and they lost their innocence. And death entered into the world. And that's when he was forced to leave us. He could not live with us in sin. He could not be anywhere near sin Death in almost every language simply means separation. So when death entered the world, separation entered the world. We were separated from Jesus. We were separated from the garden. We were separated, uh, Adam and Eve were separated from each other. They hid themselves and put clothing on. They lost their innocence. They were separated. There was a lot of separation that happened on that one day when they ate the ap apple. And imagine someone that you love very deeply, and it's happened to us all, a, a family member or a best friend of ours, uh, one day they're ripped from us. They die, and they're gone. And God felt the same thing on that afternoon when he was with Adam and Eve. Suddenly they were ripped from his presence and gone. For all intents and purposes, they were dead. And they would be dead and, uh, and estranged from him for all of eternity. He would never see them again. The people that he loved were taken away because of death. And it's not hard to imagine how he must have felt. He must have just felt terrible that this had happened. But he had a plan. That's the most important part. He had a plan. He had a plan to defeat death and to take care of it. And he gave his son and he took our place. Imagine that. He gave his son who took death upon himself and took sin upon himself and took the shame and the fear of sin and the fear of death upon himself and he went to the cross and he died for us. How much does he love us that he did that? How much does he love us that he did that one act? His son came and took everything away. You know, saying, oh, oh death, where is thou victory? Where is thy sting? He took it. He took it away. It's gone forever. We don't have to fear death. We know that. Hebrews 2.14 says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, 
He himself likewise also partook of the same. He himself shared in, in the flesh and blood. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he likewise himself took part of the same. He also shared in what? Our sins. So he came to earth and shared in our, in our flesh and blood and he shared in our sins. As a matter of fact, he did more than share in them. He took them away from us and put everything on his shoulders and that he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. God was so broken hearted that that's what he did. That's the only way to determine it. That's the only way to think about it. He was so broken hearted that he gave his only son for you and I. He partook of the same. He became blood, he became flesh, he became sin. And with his death, burial and resurrection, he murdered death and put sin away. He, he killed death, if you will, and put it away. Hebrews 2.15 says, and free those who fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. See that? He freed those who through fear of death were under slavery all of their lives. Wouldn't it be awful today to live that way? To live under the, under the fear of death? You know, someday I'm gonna die. Someday I'm going to leave. But I don't fear it. I don't fear it at all. We are free from the fear of death. It's like a shadow has been lifted from us. Even to this day, like I said, many fear it. But the Father, seeing the condition of those people who feared it, gave his Son. And all you have to do is tell your neighbors, if you don't want to fear death anymore, just believe in Jesus Christ. That's all you have to do. And the fear of death will leave you. So we're totally free, not only from, from death, but we're free from the fear of death by having faith in his son, Jesus Christ. We can look death in the eye. Really, we can look death in the eye because we are victorious. He also said, if I go away, I go away to prepare a place for you. And if I go away to prepare a place for you, I will come back and bring you to that place. So not only that, but he is waiting for us when we get there. There is a place built for us that he has built specifically for us. Imagine, imagine the place he has built for you. You probably heard me say this before too, but he knows your heart, he knows your soul, he knows, you, he knows who you are, he knows your insides. Imagine the place that he's prepared for you. What would it be like? You know, can you think about it for a minute? You got it, you got it. Sherry's got it too. Sherry says she's gonna have like, like kittens and lions and tigers and all of that, but no kitty box, you know. <laughs> but but what, what is your special place? Think about it for a moment. He's preparing that place for you. I'm excited to get there. I really am. I don't want to go today, but I'll go in his timing and of his will. But when I can't wait to get there to see that place that he's made for me. So I'm not afraid of death. I'm not afraid of death anymore. It doesn't have a hold on me. I'm free from the fear of death, the baggage of death. I don't even worry about it. What a gift that we have been given by God. So we are free from it. We no longer need it. And what we need to do now is to, instead of practicing religion, we need to practice our relationships. We need to find a relationship with Jesus Christ. Make him, make him the first thing you think about in the morning and the last thing you think about at night and throughout the day, think of him. Build a relationship with him. It's difficult because he's a spirit and we're not. We're flesh and blood and it is a little bit difficult, but the more you, it's like anything else, the more you speak to him and the more you talk to him, the more you converse with him, the easier it becomes. And you can literally find yourself having a really strong relationship with him and being in his love. Number two, sin has no power over us. We no longer have to listen to its whispers. Number three, we no longer fear death. It has no control over us. We will live in heaven with God and the Savior Jesus Christ, and it's a done deal. Imagine what happens um, when one sheep out of a hundred is found. You know the story in the Bible of one sheep? Out, what, what happens? All heaven rejoices, the angels rejoice, and heaven rejoices, and we found one sheep out of 100. Now imagine what happens in hell when that sheep is found. When that one sheep is saved, all of the demons in hell holler and hoot and, and they gnash their teeth and they mourn over the loss of that one person. So if God loves us this much, Satan hates us this much. There's a huge, huge, huge gap between the two. Be on this side because this is the final love that you'll ever have. 
In verse 4, Galatians 5.4, it says, You have been severed, if you continue to practice religion, if you continue to practice and, and the rules of religion and all the regulations of religion, he says, You have been severed from Christ. You, are, you who are seeking to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Now, that doesn't answer the age-old question, once saved or always saved because that's not in the context. When it says you have fallen from grace here, it doesn't mean that you've lost your salvation by practicing religion. That's not what he means. What he's saying in here is he's, he's talking about the relationship. That's what he's speaking about. You've, you've fallen from the grace, you've fallen out of my relationship in that sense. We don't have that bond that we once had. That would be like me sinning for, with you and now you've forgiven me, but we don't quite have that bond that we once had. If you go back, if I go back to my evil ways, if I go back to practicing religion, then I'm falling from his grace and our, and our relationship is going to hurt. It's going to suffer a little bit. We were set free of our religion. We were set free of the laws and we don't need to do it anymore. I'm in a beautiful relationship now with Jesus Christ. Why would I go back there? Why would I go back there and ruin it all? Why would I continue to sin? Why would I continue to sin against you? Why would I continue to sin against him? Because that's where it is. If we go back to the rules and the regulations and follow all of that, then guess what? We don't believe that his death was enough for us. We don't believe, we believe there's something more to do. You wake up in the morning and say, um, I know you love a lot of people, Jesus, but I happen to have done this last week, so I've got to be your best. You know, I did this or I did this. I put an extra money in the, in, the, in, the, in the till, or I did this, or I helped one of my brothers and sisters do this. But you know, I'm always helping my brothers and sisters do this, so I've got to be the best. And what you do is you just fall away from that grace. Don't go back. You're serving two masters is what you're doing. When Sherry and I were first married and had children, we understood that concept very quickly because we understood our children couldn't serve two masters. If, if they came in and said, Mommy, Mommy, can I do this? And she said, No. And then they come in and say, Daddy, Daddy, I can do this. I go, I don't care. <laughs> do what you want, you know. And then, you know it, it wouldn't work. You can't, you, our, our morals and our values weren't consistent, number one, in situations like that. And number two, they were trying to serve two masters because then when they went out and did what they wanted, they always got in trouble. I never got in trouble, they did. <laughs> so they can't follow those two, two masters. And that's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. Paul says, I was baptized into Christ Jesus. We were baptized into his death, into his burial and his resurrection. So why would we leave it? That's what we were. We were baptized into his death, his burial and his resurrection. And when we share in all those things, when we shared in his, in his death and burial and resurrection, in our private lives, when we were baptized, then we will share in that in our spiritual life, the same thing. We will share in his death, we will die, but we'll also share in his resurrection and we'll share in his eternal life. And that's all he's saying, but you have to follow those rules and that master and not these rules and this master. Because that's where most of the other rules come from, is this master and not that master. Galatians 5.13 says, For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. Boy, I'm free. God has set me free of everything. My old body's going to enjoy doing this and this and this and this and this. I can do this and I can do this and I can sin and I can do this. Boy, I'm free. No, 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 no. You want to be free, it says, serve one another through love. That's freedom. That's the freedom that he's given us, to serve each other. That's why when you walk in here, you can feel the spirit in here. We're a small family of believers, but we love one another dearly. And we help and we serve one another wherever we can, however we can. I often say I don't know what I don't know, and so if I don't know something, please tell me and so we can serve you, but I don't know what I don't know, but if I know what I know, that's great, <laughs> then, then we can serve your needs and take care of one another. Because we not only have a personal relationship with Christ Jesus and with his Father, but we have a personal relationship with one another, and that needs to be nurtured at the same time. We're all members of the body of Christ, we're all a part of the body of Christ. We all have a part and a job in the body of Christ. That's why we just feel the way we do about one another because we know we're a family and we know we're together. 
And, the, and, it, and to prove that, what has he done? He's given us a spiritual gift. He's given us spiritual gifts that we can use. Sherry and I were talking about that last night, as a matter of fact, we were, really, last night. And I said, I can't believe the gifts that God has given you and given me, I just can't believe it. I mean, how, I could never do that, I could never do that, I could never do that, but when you, when you need to do that, when he wants you to do that, he gives you that gift. And the more you use this gift, he'll give you another gift. And the more you use that gift, he'll give you another gift. And I'm sure there's things that you feel the same way about. My, my first gift that I got when I took one of those tests, I probably told you it was hospitality. Yeah, I filled it all out and I got hospitality. I said, that sucked. <laughs> I mean, I want a prophecy. You know, I want something cool, but, but hospitality. Well, what I did was we started a Bible study in our house. And when we started a Bible study in our house, it grew to 10 people and to 20 people. And guess what? It grew into a small church. And we had a church of about 40 people. But that's because we had the gift of hospitality to start with. <laughs> so prophecy, I didn't see that coming. So I didn't get prophecy, but I did get hospitality. And the other thing, too, is we have to use our spiritual gifts if we want the body to remain. I just, spiritual gifts, some are very open, right? Some are very open. We see them in the, in, in the church all the time. Somebody's doing this or somebody's doing that. But some aren't. Some are hidden in the sense that they happen at home or uh, away from the church where you're helping neighbors and other friends. And so we all have those gifts, and some of them are very prominent and some of them aren't, but they're all very important is the point I'm trying to make. They're all extremely important because if we don't do them, what can happen to the body? It can die. A church can die. A church can basically go through death just because the members aren't utilizing the gifts and the spirit that God has given them. Don't turn your freedom into an opportunity to flush. This can be a problem, really, too, because we were born slaves, right? Before we knew Jesus Christ, we were slaves to the earth. We were slaves to the worldly. We were slaves to sin and everything else. Uh, and the problem is, is now that we're born again, we still have that memory in our head. Don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. See, the fleshy side of our memory is still there. That was fun. I enjoyed that. I like doing that. And so we kind of live on this tight rope where we have to walk, where we, you know, we don't want to fall back on, off this tightrope. And either way, we want to stay in the spirit and stay without sin. And one of the things to do is not take our freedom into our own hands. And that's what we do sometimes too. I'm good, I can get this, I got this God. I got this, it's all set, I'm free. I know what I'm doing with it. Don't worry, I won't overdo it. Well, that's a problem sometimes, so. So Paul tells us we're free from religion, free from sin and its effects, free from death and the fear of death. And finally, we're free from Satan's grip. And that's finish up with this, that's, that's big too, that's huge. Satan is our biggest enemy, but we are free of him and his effects and of his, uh, in his interest in us. By putting the pleasures of God first, we can put the pleasures of Satan behind us. Put the pleasures of God first. What pleases God? What would he like me to do in this situation? How would he like me to act in this situation? What does he want of me in this situation, in my life, in my, in my personal life, in my church life? What does he want? We can conquer the devil when we claim our identity too. I've used that one a lot. Devil, get away from me. I'm a child of God. Don't you know who you're messing with? You're not just messing with Ray. You're messing with a child of God and I am not gonna do that. Take that thought out of my mind and don't bring it back. Take those words from my lips and don't let me say them. Just by claiming your identity, he flees, he's gone. And the temptation is gone. If it's not in front of you, you're not tempted. So in other words, if you don't want to be tempted, get rid of him. Get him out of your eyesight and put him behind yourself. So Galatians, Galatians 5, he sets us free in so many ways. Uh, free from religion, free from uh, fear of death, and free from Satan's grasp. Um, we're losing some of our freedoms today though, aren't we? We have the freedom, uh, we have the, what is it, Declaration of Independence. And then the, um, the nation, the, the um, United Nations came up with the Declaration of Human Rights, and uh, we're just kind of losing them. We're losing some of those freedoms a little bit, little bit, little bit, and I think what's happening is I think it's because the end is near. Amen. I truly do think that the end is, is very close by. The United States has to diminish so the rest of the world can rise up because all of this takes place over there, not over here. 
and I can see that happening. But our freedom is secure if we're in Christ. If we're in Christ, we can be put into bondage. We can be, everything in the world can happen to us. Paul was put in jail, he was stoned, he was left for dead. Other uh, disciples and apostles were murdered and put to death, but they never lost their freedom. And that's what we need to think of as we go forward. We'll always be free in Christ and we'll always enjoy our freedom from Him. I'll leave you with this. Augustine said that God loves each one of us as if we are the only person on the planet. God loves each one of us as if we were the only person on the planet. Think of that. You are the only person on the planet and you sinned and God would send his son Jesus to die for you individually and personally if there was just one. Think of that this week as we go forward. Let us pray.